nobody predicted how scary Halloween 2003, the sun, turned out to be. The explosions in the sun, the facts on Earth, the solar storms. I don't want to scare you. This is not common. It has happened before, and it will happen again. So I want to tell you that story. This is the sun, the huge, perfect ball in the sky. How huge? Well, to, to give a quick comparison, if that's the sun, the diameter of the sun is 100 times the size of the diameter of the Earth. So I have a prop, a very high-tech prop, to the socks of the conference. <laughs> This would be this, the Earth to scale toward the, the sun right there. And how far it is? I will need to take these socks to the end of the hall, to the end of the building, and to the road, 100 yards or so away. That's how far we, all of us, are from the sun. The sun is a powerful place. Don't be fooled by the, by the image of the sun. It consumes every second as much energy as the entire humanity in half a million years. I want to take you to a story. I want to take you to space. This is how the sun looks like from space in one of those nice filters NASA has in one of the missions. And you see that it has a lot of activity. And the sun rotates, rotates around itself just once a month or, or so. And as the sun rotates, you see that sometimes you start to see from the limb on one side, from one side of the sun, the things coming up to us. And maybe you start to realize what's going on here. The, more, the better we understand what's coming on from that size, the more we know when there's an explosion on the sun. Why? Because there are explosions. And that's what happened in 2003. But before that happened, it was a fairly OK looking sun. This was today, on the 15th, right now, is when the Chinese sent their first astronaut, the first Taikonaut, was in space right about now when the sun was fairly OK. As the time went by, we started to see from that side of the sun something was coming up. And then on October 23, it happened. There was an explosion on the sun. What do we mean by an explosion of the sun? You can see a video right there. You can see the flash there. It looks like not much. Remember the sizes. That explosion is bigger than the whole Earth. And when that happens, it sends, sends radiation everywhere that is, can be seen. Because we can see that explosion, the, the radiation from that explosion comes to Earth. And it's so energetic. It's like X-rays, it's gamma rays. It's a lot of energy that heats up the atmosphere and creates problems on Earth, on atmosphere. It ionizes the atmosphere. It, create, it makes radiation communications by radio problematic. When those things happen, it, there are problems on Earth. Not only because of the radiation, sometimes it expels clouds of plasma. In this case, because it was on the side, that was fine. It just sent it towards the side, to the universe. That's fine. But as the sun kept moving, we were getting closer and closer to a region of the sun that if that happens again, it will hit us. Let me put the socks on the floor, because it looks weird. <laughs> <laughs> and as we get closer to that region of the sun, and it, that, that happens, solar physicists were kind of looking, squinting, oh no, if, that, if there's another explosion of those, it's going to be bad for us. And then October 28, it happened. The highest class of explosion, an X-rate flare, happened so big that it saturated the camera. You can see the saturation on that screen. Immediately, again, the effects of the radiation, again, the ionization, again, the partial radio communications. But then this time, it also sent a plasma cloud toward us. Normally, when the sun emits little particles, it's called solar wind, it takes four days to arrive here. This thing arrived in half a day. And it blasted through the instrument that was in space. You can see how the image gets all with like snow. That's the camera on this spacecraft getting hit by all those ions in the ball of plasma. This is another view from space. The sun is in the center. And then you can see how it really whacks out the camera for a few hours. Luckily, the Earth, that tiny ball far away, 
has a protection. It's called the magnetic field. And our magnetosphere is able to stop that cloud and deflect it towards the poles. And when it gets to the poles, it creeps down towards the atmosphere. And when it hits our atmosphere, it shines. And it creates the auroras. Those are the auroras. This one was so huge that you could see auroras in Florida. It's not the poles in Florida. That, it was that big. Astronauts on the International Space Station, they had to shelter on the Russian module, because it's, it's tiny, it's a little bit thicker. The static currents in Sweden made blackouts that lasted hours. A satellite, half a billion dollar satellite, basically got fried because of this. If we take a look, closer look of those events that create explosions on the sun, this is how it looks like. Remember the sizes. The Earth is tiny compared to this. What you're seeing there is basically magnetodynamics, magnetohydrodynamics. It's a little bit complicated to explain um, in 10 minutes, so I got another prop, which is high tech, which is a cable. So basically, what you're seeing here is that in the sun, you don't dominate the magnetic field. The magnetic field dominates you. I have a magnetic field here. There's a receiver there. I can move it around as much as I want. In the sun, it's the opposite. It's so big that it could only be able to move it towards the receiver. So what you see there is the, the magnetic lines on the sun like this. And as they evolve, sometimes they twist, and they twist, and they twist. And guess what happens when they snap? The tension gets released, the lower half gets flattened, and the top half gets away. And that's what you're, what you're seeing there. Those are the reconnections events on solar flares that make that plasma that is forced to move around the magnetic fields rain down, explode, reconnect. <laughs> this is several hundred times the size of the Earth. As we were dealing with those effects of October 29 flare that arrived on October 29, Halloween, close to Halloween, well, guess what? There was another explosion, again, X-type explosion. This time, because the interplanetary space was cleaned up by the previous one, it also arrived very quickly. And again, we had the same effects. Again, we had the, all the alerts. The GPS degraded. It sent a location that was less accurate to the point that the planes had to separate from each other more because of these degradation effects. Radio communications, not only over the horizon, but also the communications. It happened again. That was the solar storms of Halloween 2003. And this is the, the image again of the camera barely recovered from the previous one. You can see the, the effects hitting the spacecraft a few hours later. You can see it again happening here. That little white dot there is a planet. You can see also planets from that camera. This is another event where the magnetic flux is just twisted, and then the explosion happens, the recognition happens, and it sends a humongous amount of plasma, that's a physical unit, a humongous amount of planet towards the space, and then it was not that huge, so it rained down on the sun again. The sun is a powerful beast. So let's make a map of that. We love, we love maps, right? So if we make a map of the sun, because you only see half the sun, you only get half the map. And because the sun rotates, you, the, the half of the, that you see moves. And that's what you see there. NASA sent when I was uh, doing this for my postdoc, sent a spacecraft, it's called Stereo. Stereo because it's one of the spacecraft that is slightly ahead of the Earth, and the other one that is slightly behind. So as, as they separate, the one here peaks over the limb in this side, and the other one here peaks on the limb on the other side. When you make the projection of the, of the two um, images, in a, like a, it's kind of like a Mercator kind of map, as like you see there, then you start to fill the gaps in between and you feel more gaps as they are wider, more and more separated. The one that is behind sees what's coming up, which is the important stuff, but then the one here sees what after you stop seeing it from Earth. And what happens here is that I start to see what's happening in the whole surface of the sun. You see that the active regions that create these explosions, how they appear, how they move, and again, this is this is like if they go through the surface, they appear a little bit like this, and they start to be like maybe two, that's the sunspot, two spots there, then they evolve, they could reconnect, or maybe not, maybe they, they stay in place for a couple of rotations, maybe disappear. This is critical to understand the space weather. That's what a lot of people are, and 
studying these, these, these maps of the sun to understand how we can predict or prepare for the effects that could happen. As the sun kept moving, it went away from the region of the sun that it was active for the Earth. If there was another flare, it would, it would still have the problems of the explosions, but you don't get the effect of the, um, of the, of the ball of plasma coming towards you. Just as the active region disappeared from our view, it happened again. This is what happened. That right there is the biggest solar flare ever recorded. It's X class, supposed to be from 1 to 10. This is what they thought it was class 20. It turns out to be it was class 47. There is no scale for that. It's a massive amount of energy. It's so to the side, and it still created a lot of problems on Earth again. It blinded the instruments again, and you can see the view from the side, that cloud moving away towards the right on the instruments. And that's another image of the blast of, that was created there. This is a view of another flare, because we love uh, movies of flares. When it, when it happens, it sends a tsunami a wave, a propagating wave, that it again completely destroys that cloud of plasma that is magnetically hanging over the surface of the sun. You can see it again how it suddenly happens. And remember the sizes. This is a tsunami that is moving Earth's, Earth's sizes in just a few hours. It's absolutely incredible. Eric, today, this morning, let me land this back towards us. This morning said the phrase which was, stories ignite imagination, and imagination ignites exploration. I would add that stories that break our assumption inspire innovation. The stories of the explosions of the sun, I thought it was a cool story. But I also thought that I, while I was tiptoeing to a lot of those words, some of you hung around to, hey, wait a minute. I said surface of the sun. What is the surface of the sun? There's no surface of the sun. It's a ball of gas. So when we need to make a map of something that is gassy, what are we making a map of? When the, when the whole thing moves, rotates differentially, how do we map those things? When there is a region that is more important than others, how do we keep track of those things? I will not tell those answers, because I like when you end the talk with more questions than answers. But I hope I was able to inspire and break assumptions so that when we keep exploring, we use those assumptions we never thought of to maybe innovate. Especially, for example, when you do augmented reality. One of the things here is that you are, you, you are seeing 3D objects in a 2D space. When you do AR, you also need to do that. You need to deal with those projection effects and all these this weird half transparencies and alpha channels. Maybe watching these movies or thinking about making an AR of the sun explosions, which would be super cool to do, would be a good way to, to test the technology. So I hope that I broke some of your assumption of what the sun is or what are solar explosions. And let's go to the party. <laughs>